Uh, good evening. I'm, I'm just going to speak a little bit about Charles and my personal experience of his work. Um, I think like all of you, um, we've all come here because we've been inspired in some way uh, by his work. Um, I first came across a book called The Ascent of Humanity. A, a dear friend of mine gave me a copy. Um, I was, I'd been living money this for um, a couple of years and um, it, the, the book completely changed my perspective on life. Um, I, it, it made me think about things I'd never even previously thought about before. And so last year when Sacred Economics came out I was obviously very excited, like most of you as well. Um, and for those of you who haven't read it, it's, it's an absolutely incredible piece of work. I think to fully understand um, how, how brilliant Sacred Economics is, you have to probably read Descent of Humanity first. Um, in my opinion, I think Charles is probably one of the, one of the greatest thinkers we have today. Um, but the one thing that, really, um, that, that I really like about Charles is that he's actually got heart as well. Like I think he's probably going to speak a lot about um, economics and the problems with economics and some of the problems with money and how we can fix it. Um, but I think um, behind a lot of that is, is, is there's a spiritual aspect to that and an awful lot of heart. Um, I think given the fact that he's only got one hour to speak and, and some questions and answers after, I think we're going to do maybe, maybe 45 minutes of questions and answers. Um, uh, I think it's impossible from the, to, to speak about everything that is in sacred economics and in the ascent of humanity, so I really encourage both of you to pick up a copy of both of those books. Um, I'm getting 10% commission of everything, so Charles is getting me to sell hard here. Um, but yeah, so one other thing, yes, read both the books. Um, the other thing is that Charles has obviously come from America, so if you leave here tonight feeling that you have been really touched by what he's spoken about or really touched by the fact he's come here and dedicated his life to um, trying to create something a bit more beautiful, um, then do please feel free to um, offer what you would call a counter gift kind of um, at the at the table um, up by oh, have we got a we've got a bucket for donations yeah um, so yeah please donate it's uh, it's not it's not cheap coming from America obviously um, I'll just is that better Anyway, yeah, so I'll probably, on that note, I'll probably hand you over to, um, to Charles. Um, and I'd like you to give him a round of applause that's kind of worthy of the journey he's made from, um, from America. So, welcome, Charles. Nice. Thanks, Mark, for that. Uh, yeah, so I, I will probably talk at least a little bit about economics. Um, but Mark was kind of getting at something that, that I think everybody feels when you look at the financial crisis. You have this feeling that it's really not about that. Part of that feeling is, is that it's almost like this feeling that, that the world is falling apart. And maybe I should stand back a little. We're getting a little feedback here. A feeling that, that the crisis that we face today, in some sense, goes all the way to the bottom. Even the elites understand this when they talk about, in secret, on their financial websites, they, they call it extend and pretend recognizing that none of their solutions can possibly reach deep enough. And I think that, that many of us are getting that understanding as well, that this crisis goes all the way to the bottom. And all the way to the bottom means that it includes all aspects of our being, what you would call the heart, uh, the spirit, the feelings, the embodiment, and not just this abstract realm of symbols that we call money, I mean, money is really abstract. It's physical reality today. At most, it's these slips of paper, which weigh hardly anything. 
Uh, and most of it is just bits in computers. It almost doesn't exist at all. So I want to, um, if you were here for a very comprehensive analytic talk about money systems, um, you're not going to get that much of that. Uh, but I will touch on that, and I will touch on, on all of the other levels uh, as well. To really make it simple, uh, I can say that all of this work is based on um, an understanding of the universe based on the gift. It's not just an economic, an approach to economics, it's also a cosmology. And it echoes ancient cultures' cosmology, uh, where they saw the universe as essentially operating on the principles of a gift. And this is something that, that we can all tap into. I don't, it's, that, it's that feeling of primal gratitude that you have when you're thirsty and you have a drink of water. And you realize that even if you did walk over to the tap and get the water yourself, you realize that you didn't earn the presence of water in this universe. There's a, we all have this underlying knowledge that that water was a gift. And that our breath is a gift. And that the ground beneath our feet is a gift. We didn't earn any of these things. That our lives are a gift. We didn't earn being nursed when we were babies and protected and taken care of and clothed and fed. We didn't earn having this beautiful planet that, that creates food even if we don't really know how to make it happen. We don't have, really can't engineer food. Even today, we, just, we can insert different genes and things, but, but we don't know how to make food. We, don't, we didn't make the sun either. None of these things were earned. They all came as a gift. And that means that we are born into gratitude. Gratitude being the feeling, the knowledge of having received, and the desire to give in turn. And that's written very deeply into human nature. That's why if you, well, let me just say economics, generally speaking, economics denies that. And they say, no, 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 human nature really is about maximizing your self-interest, maximizing your utility. Uh, and it's based on biology, uh, which teaches or has taught until quite recently that we are driven by our genes to maximize reproductive self-interest. Okay. But I think we know better. One reason that, that we know better is that you could have a job that pays you really well, but if that job doesn't engage your gifts, you're going to be very dissatisfied with that job. You're going to feel like you're living somebody else's life, the life that you are paid to live, but not your life. I've had those moments before when I was quite young. I was like, well, I remember actually a key moment when I was 28 years old, 27 maybe. I was living in Taiwan. I was a translator and business consultant back then, in a former lifetime. And we were having a meeting. I was meeting with some people, executives in a software company, and they were discussing their uh, new product features and 3D sound and this, that, and the other thing. And I looked around the room and I was like, hold on. You mean you guys actually care about this? And your market share? Because I'm just pretending to care about it. Because you're paying me to. So I had a, f a few moments of gloating superiority, you know. Um, you, know I, yeah, you know, I get that and you don't, you know. Um, but, but then, the next feeling was terror. Because I thought, do I ever get to do something I care about for real? And I couldn't imagine anything, doing anything that I cared about for real that would pay me the same amount of money. And I began to think, well, for one, well, I couldn't do that job much longer, actually. Um, and that launched me on a very long journey to discover 
what it is that I do actually care about because I've been so conditioned to doing things I didn't care about for the sake of an external reward. I mean, that starts in school, doesn't it? Where the external reward is grades and you do things you don't actually care about to get good grades and that conditions you for a life of doing things you don't care about. It's no coincidence. The school system was created by industrialists. Um, I won't go into that story right now. So I wondered, so, right, so that launched this journey, and I also wondered, why should it be this way? Why should it be that the things I really care about, there's no money in those? The things, the, the things that make my heart sing, there's no money in those. And the things I don't want to do very much, that's where the money is. The things that are destroying the planet, that's where the money is. Why should it be that way? Why shouldn't money instead be aligned with the gift? Why shouldn't it be that the things that I want to give to the world are the things that will also give me money? The things that I want to do in service to society and to the planet will generate money that supports me. Why shouldn't it be that way? Why should money be aligned with things that are not sacred to me? And that's where I get the title of Sacred Economics. It's about how to align money with the things that are becoming sacred to us, starting with the healing of the planet, the healing of society. Um, so I think that everybody has probably had this kind of experience that, of, of that feeling like, I wasn't put here on earth to do this. Even if you're paid 10 million pounds a year, if your job was simply to sit there and type numbers, meaningless numbers, into a computer, you would eventually start having that feeling. No amount of money would be enough to quell that feeling. Because your gifts have to go, not only do your gifts have to be engaged, but they have to go towards something that's, that's meaningful to you. Or again, you're going to feel that, that you're not living your life. You know, this is a, a quite a strange situation here. Um, looking out at a sea of strange faces. This uh, was unheard of in hunter-gatherer times or in medieval times, in the uh, Saxon period in England. Everybody you knew was, uh, was an intimate acquaintance. And everybody that you saw, you knew their stories and they knew your stories. And you knew that what you did, the way you acted, would come back to you. If you were very generous, then everybody would know that and they would be generous to you too. If you were very stingy or mean, uh, then the effects of that would come back to you as well. This is related to what I'm going to be talking about, um, the revolution, the revolution of the gift economy. And I'm using the word revolution here in a very deep sense. Um, I mentioned it before, this idea that everything is changing. And I want to explain what is so revolutionary about gift economy, or the spirit of the gift, or the cosmology of the gift. Um, it's something that is foreign to us today because we are so conditioned uh, to see the world as a competitive arena in which more for you is less, is less for me. In a gift culture, it wasn't like that. One of the features of the gift, of a gift culture, is that if you have more than you need, you, you're, you're not going to hoard it for yourself you're going to give your excess to somebody else who needs it. And that's not just because you're a nice person. It's because that's where security, status, and everything that we call wealth comes from. Because if you give to the people generously in your community, then they're going to kind of owe you one. They're going to want to give to you as well. It's just like if you um, borrow 
even if it's a small thing, you borrow even a corkscrew from, from your neighbor. I had to do that last year. I borrow a corkscrew from my neighbor, okay? And I return it to him. And now he feels like he has kind of permission to ask me for a small favor too. A gift creates a bond between people, unlike a financial transaction. So if I, if, if I borrowed my, cork, my neighbor's corkscrew and I returned it to him and say, here's a dollar, uh, he would actually be insulted because I'm saying, I don't want this bond with you. I want the relationship to be over. So today we live in a society that's increasingly monetized. Therefore, we live in a society where there are no bonds. And that is the reason, or one reason, why we lack community today. Because community is simply a group of people who, among whom gifts circulate. And you know that if you give to somebody in the community, then the community will give back to you too. So in a gift culture, it's not true that more for you is less for me. We're not fundamentally in competition. Because if you have some good fortune, then your surplus will come to me. Maybe not directly, but you'll give to somebody who will give to somebody who will give to me. And if you have bad fortune, then you'll have less to give to me. So gift culture corresponds to a very different sense of ourselves, what it is to exist, what it is to be. It corresponds to a different way of looking at the universe. Money is not like that. And I'm going to explain why, I think. I think I'll move on to that. Um, money has to do with, the, okay, this explanation is going to also include the answer to the question, why is it that money is not aligned with the sacred today? Why is it that money is the ally of the things I don't want to do and the enemy of the things I do want to do? Generally speaking, I don't, I don't want to overgeneralize here. I mean, there are some people who do what they love and they're making lots of money at it and it's fine. Okay? This is, but I'm, I'm generally speaking, money is not aligned with what is sacred to us as individuals. And when you ask, when you investigate any, any big problem in the world, any, anything horrible happening, like why is, why is there a war in Afghanistan? Why maybe now in Iran soon? And why, why are we cutting down the rainforest? And you ask, why is this happening? And very soon you get to money. Money's making it happen. So it's obviously, if there's anything that's not sacred in this world, it's money. And that's a puzzle that it should be that way because money isn't a law of the universe. It doesn't exist outside of human creation. We've created money to be that way. Money is simply a story. It's a set of interpretations of symbols. And we have created, or it's a set of agreements, you could say it's a set of agreements that to use something as a medium of exchange and a store of value and a unit of account. So you could ask, why have we created a set of agreements? Why have we created this story that's driving the planet toward destruction. Why couldn't we create a different story? Well, we can create a different story. And in fact, we will create a different story because the money system as we have known it is falling apart. And the collapse of that money system, which even the elites recognize is happening when they talk about pretend and extend, the collapse of that money system is tied into the collapse of the larger agreements that include the agreement of money. So I'm going to, let me explain kind of how money works. Um, like, in ancient Greece, the city-state was the, was the one that could issue money. So how, is it, how does it work today? And a lot of people already know this story. Um, but I'm going to go through it anyway in just five minutes or so. And if you are an economist, you might see many, many ways in which I'm oversimplifying it, um, not distinguishing between the monetary base and M1 and M2, or not talking about shadow banking systems and, and whatever. Okay. This is a really basic understanding of it. 
that fundamentally won't lead you astray. Okay, so most people know that money today is created by lending. It's lent into existence by banks. So if, if I'm a bank and I lend you, say, a million pounds, I'm not really taking that money from someone else's savings account and putting it in yours. Uh, but what I'm doing is I'm creating new money by an accounting entry in your savings account. Okay? New money, a million pounds. Now there are a million more pounds in existence. Now, how do I decide who to do that for? Well, I'll do it if I think that you're going to be able to pay me back. Pay me back not just one million pounds, because there's interest on this loan. You have to pay me back, say, two million pounds over whatever, 10 years, whatever the interest rate is, okay? You have to pay me back more than I lent you. Well, that's not a problem, because you are such a, a, a great entrepreneurial, creative person, you're going to take that million pounds and you're going to make the world's best chocolate. And you're going to sell it to everybody else in the room. You're going to make three million pounds doing that. And pay me back my two million and you're going to get rich too. No problem. The first problem comes from the fact that everybody in the room is in the same boat. Because all money, not just some money, but all money is created through that process. So everybody in the room has a million pounds. Everybody in the room owes me two million pounds. Where's the extra money going to come from? Essentially, you are all in competition with each other for never enough money. And I don't know if that phrase rings a bell in your life. In competition for never enough money. So the way that money is created creates along with it scarcity, anxiety, and competition. Now, it wouldn't last very long if that were all to the story. Half of you would go bankrupt, and there would be a revolution very quickly. Um, but that's not all to the story. Because what happens when all, that, all those loans are due? Well, by then, you can all pay them back because I've created even more money in the interim. I've lent even more money into existence. And that comes with even more debt. But that's okay, because when that comes due, I will have lent even more money into existence. And all the while, how do I know who to lend it to? It's if you have a good business plan. If you're going to create goods and services and sell them to other people, then I can keep lending money into existence and the system will keep working. No problem. The only problem with this, well, not the only problem, but the flagrant problem with this comes if there's a limit to growth. If there's a limit to growth, for example, maybe the planet can't accommodate more growth, then we've got a problem. Because now, there's no one with a good... I'm exaggerating. There are not enough people with a good business plan for me to lend enough money to pay back all of the loans on the existing, from the existing money. There's not enough money. And I, stop, and, and I stop lending because there's no growth that's going to create new business plans. And when I stop lending, then the debts keep rising faster than income. Wealth concentrates into fewer and fewer hands. Unemployment runs rampant, and you see everything that's happening today. And that's the nature of today's crisis. It's a crisis of growth. And that's why all the politicians are talking about, you know, reigniting economic growth. And that would solve the problem. But what is economic growth? What, what are these goods and services? And can they keep growing forever? Well, Goods are essentially, okay, so it only counts as a good or a service if it's being exchanged for money, right? So if your business plan is, hey, Charles, uh, I would like a million pounds to, there's a threatened wetlands out there, I'd like to buy that and protect it. 
Otherwise, it'll be threatened with development. And what do you mean that's not a good or a service? That's very valuable to society, but you're not going to be selling anything. So that doesn't count. If your business plan is, you know, Charles, people have forgotten how to cook for themselves. They've lost this skill, and, and I'm going to teach them how to do that again. And, and I'm not going to charge them money for it. Or I'm going to, I'm going to, people don't take care of their own kids anymore. They're shipped off to daycare. I'm going to create a neighborhood daycare co-op so that, that people can collectively take care of their own kids and they won't have to pay for daycare anymore. Okay, there's no money in any of these things. But if your business plan is, I'm going to buy that wetlands, pave it over, uh, get the zoning changed because I have friends on city council. Uh, see, here's my Rolodex, here's my business plan, and I'm going to make, okay, that's a business plan. I'm going to set up a daycare center so that people can pay for daycare instead of taking care of their own kids. That's a new service. I'm going to uh, build a supermarket with a deli in it so that people, because they're busy now, and, and they, can, they can pay for food preparation instead of preparing it for themselves. Okay, that's a new service. So what's happened is over centuries is that the realm, the non-monetary realm, which you could say is the realm of the gift, has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk, and the monetized realm has grown. So one aspect of that is that nature is converted into product. The other aspect is that relationships are converted into services. I mentioned a couple, like food and childcare, two of the biggest growth areas, food preparation and childcare. Uh, if you go back enough generations, you see other, other aspects of human relationship that have been converted into money. For example, um, entertainment. A hundred years ago, uh, because we didn't have the recording technology, well, 130 years ago, whatever, um, music wasn't something you usually paid for. Maybe rich people went to the opera or something like that, but most people sang songs and played instruments. Singing was, you heard singing all over the place, all the time. In America, uh, 100 years ago or 80 years ago, every small town had its own marching band and put on its own parade, and it was a really big deal, and everybody was into it. And so people, and it didn't cost money to do that. But today we pay for music. Um, we didn't used to pay for, for medical care. Every village had a couple herbalists. Maybe if things got really bad, you'd have to hire the doctor with his little black bag. Um, but people didn't usually pay for medical care. Um, people didn't pay for drinking water. Bottled water, that's a new thing too. So in case somebody is here with the, uh, maybe you kind of wandered into the wrong place and you thought this was going to be about uh, getting rich. Um, well, it is kind of about getting rich because the growth of all of these things has impoverished us in other ways. But I will offer you a business plan if you are here to get rich. And that's just to find something that people get for free from nature or from each other, take it away, and sell it back. So pollute the water, sell them bottled water. Um, De-skill people and sell them services. Um, scare them into not letting their kids run free and then they can pay for video games and indoor activities. Almost anything can be converted into money. Play, for example. When I was a kid, I, we, we would wander off, after breakfast, we'd wander off, our parents didn't know where, and do all kinds of dangerous things, come back, and we had this, this kingdom of imagination. Uh, and so today, all, the, all these you know, adventures we had, and today, closer? Today, we, uh, children purchase these adventures and have online virtual adventures that have kind of replaced the kingdom of the outdoors. Okay, so you get the picture here.
um, this conversion of life into money. Now, an economist might say that we're better off because of this. We're better off because it's more efficient for the supermarket deli to make a thousand meals than for everybody to make their own meal. It's more efficient for the daycare teachers to take care of 20 kids rather than for each family to take care of their own kids. It's more efficient for uh, whatever her name is to sing all of our songs for us. And, and the economists would say that's actually what we want because we're willing to pay for it. And we wouldn't pay for it if we didn't want it. But I think that we can, we've noticed that we've only become richer in the ways that we can measure. And we've become poorer and poorer in the ways that we can't measure. Life has become impoverished in, in, in qualitative ways. So we have lots more food, but not as much food that's really prepared with love. We have lots more music, but it's all impersonal. We don't have as much music that's, that's actually sung to you. And if you've ever been serenaded by a lover, you know kind of what's missing. And we're, we're missing the, the, the personal and, and the authentic and the intimate, which makes us hungry for these things. And to meet this hunger, maybe we consume more and more and more of the stuff that we can count, of the stuff that's available. And I think that's what drives a lot of our consumerism. People think it's greed that drives this endless consumerism and this, this uh, urge to, to live in a bigger house and have a bigger bank account and, and all that. But I think it comes, comes down to, to what I was talking about before. I mean, here we are in a room full of strangers. This is profoundly unnatural. Human beings evolved to look around and and you knew everybody intimately, and everybody knew your story, and you knew the, the name of every hill and of every tree, and it was an intimate friend of yours, and you knew the stories, the mythological stories of, these, of these, every feature of the land, and the story of when your best friend's little brother uh, fell through the ice at, on that pond, uh, and you knew this, the stories of, of your friend's children and their, your friend's parents, and they knew you, and so therefore you knew yourself. Every bird that you saw, you could see a bird, you'd know what its song was and what time of day it sang its song and what type of plants it used for its nest and the medicinal qualities of those plants and what kind of soil they grew in. And so we were immersed in this connected realm and we felt at home in the universe. Today we are cut off from that and not only by our economic system. Because the economic system doesn't exist in isolation from everything else. It rests on a deeper foundation. And this deeper foundation is also falling apart today. I call it the story of the people. It's the defining myth of our culture. Every culture has one. Every culture has its own answer to the deep questions like, who are you? What's important in life? Where did we come from? Where are we going? What is a human being? What's valuable? What's real? The answer that we have, there's two aspects of it. There's the individual aspect, the story of self, and the collective aspect, which I could call the story of the people. And the individual aspect says basically that, that what a self is, it's this discrete, separate individual in a world of other discrete, separate individuals, and, and this world is external to you. Every field of thought phrases this in a different way. So religion would say, yeah, you're this soul encased in flesh. And there's other souls out there, and then there's God up there. 
Uh, and so you're separate from the other souls, separate from God, and separate from materiality, separate from the world. Because what you really are is that soul, you're not the flesh. Okay, so there's separation right there. And I'm not talking about um, esoteric religion, okay? I'm talking about just what religion has been for most of us. Um, and science is the same. Biology, the separate self, is this flesh robot programmed by its genes to maximize reproductive self-interest. In physics, it's, again, a flesh machine operating according to deterministic laws in an objective universe, okay? All obsolete, obsolete physics, obsolete biology, but that's what, what it's been, been telling us. Psychology, you know, you're this kind of bubble of psychology bouncing around among other bubbles of psychology. Uh, you are a mind, you are a moat of consciousness, as Descartes described it. You're this little moat of consciousness, and so you're separate from other people, and of course, if there's me here, and you there, and the universe out there, then the more I control of that, the less there is for you. So our basic answer to who are you already encodes competition, scarcity, and anxiety. And our money system fits perfectly into that worldview. You may have noticed that that worldview is becoming obsolete. And we are, we are transitioning into a different story of the self. And you could call it the connected self. The ecological self. It's the, the self that understands that every person out here is part of me, a reflection of me, a mirror of myself, part of myself, and same with the world. And we're not actually separate. All of us are undergoing a shift in consciousness of this nature, experiencing ourselves in different ways, still very much subject to the habits of the separate self, the habits of thought, the habits of being, but moving, shifting. Which means that the, the psychic foundation for the money institution and for all of our other institutions is gone. The ground underneath is shifting. That is one way to, to, to understand why there is a crisis in all of our institutions. They're all obsolete. They don't shift as fast as our consciousness, though. They have more inertia. They're, they're more solid. Um, and that's why we have this disconnect between our consciousness and our institutions. And that's why money is not aligned with the things that are becoming sacred to us, with the things that are beautiful to us. It's still built on the old story of self. And it tries to pull us back into that story of self. Another way to put it is that if what makes your heart sing is not to increase the number of products, or to find something to sell, then there's not going to be a job for you. The money isn't in the things that you want to do because the money system is aligned with separation. And there's another really important part, actually. It's also aligned with the story of the people on the collective level. And I call that one ascent, ascent, rising. Um, and this story basically says that says, well, you know, once upon a time, human beings were these animals, helpless, naked, superstitious, ignorant, barely surviving, subject to the whims of nature, at the mercy of natural forces. But thanks to our big brains, we began to ascend above nature. We developed science that replaced ignorant superstition. We developed technology that replaced impotent ritual. And slowly but surely, we became the lords and masters of nature. And look at what we've done. We have harnessed fossil fuels. First we harnessed the animals, then we harnessed fossil fuels. We can, we've changed the course of rivers. We've built, taken down mountains and built new ones. And, and, and 
exceeded the speed of sound and, and we can do things that no other animal can do. And that's just the beginning. Someday, maybe with nanotechnology, genetic engineering, atomic power, well, that's a little bit, that was in the 40s. But this myth has been going on a long time, okay? I mean, it was, I mean, Descartes actually uh, wrote about that, and, and, and futurists were saying that in 1800, you know, they're saying, yes, we're becoming the masters of nature, and, and soon we will live in, in leisure and ease. It's been predicted again and again and again. Soon we will conquer all disease. That's what they were saying in the 50s. It seemed obvious then. And, and so the, the, the story says that someday our control over nature will be complete. It says someday we will conquer all disease. We will synthesize our food. We won't even need nature. We'll go off into space. We will maybe even conquer death by uploading our consciousness into computers. Our control will be complete. Gee whiz, what's next? Uh, and as you can tell, this story is also becoming obsolete. Mostly because it's not working very well. Like, I don't think many people still believe, as the experts were saying in the 50s, that we will conquer all disease by the year 2000. I don't think most people believe the top futurist of the 1980s, Alvin Toffler, who said, by the year 2000, the greatest problem facing society will be what to do with all our leisure time. And he predicted 150 days of vacation a year, 30-hour work weeks, you know, almost as good as hunter-gatherers enjoy, but not quite. And you know, the space colonies, those were supposed to be in place by the 90s. I remember when I was a kid. Remember, like, the rocket mania had, I had, like, a rocket board game, I had, like, model rockets. Even my shampoo bottle was in the shape of a rocket, you know? And, like, you were naive if you thought that we wouldn't have space colonies by the year 2000. So we don't have an age of leisure. In fact, we're working harder than in 1973. We don't have the end of disease. We don't have 200-year lifespans. In fact, lifespans are beginning to decline in some places, in America, for example. And our mastery of nature seems to have run into a few problems, too, as it increasingly is running out of control. Clinging tightly to that story of ascent, we would say, well, the problem is that we just need some more technology, more control more of the same. If what you're doing isn't working, do more of it. Which is kind of crazy. Money is also part of this story of ascent. Because, because of, its, if, of its nature, because of, I explained how, how interest drives growth, it necessitates growth and it drives growth, um, because we're all under endless debt pressure, directly or indirectly, to find something else to bring into the human realm, into the realm of money and property. So it's part of this growth paradigm. And again, that story is becoming obsolete. And, 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 and 100 years ago, it wasn't. You know, 100 years ago, if you were a bright young person, idealistic, a go-getter, you would be totally psyched to invent a faster way to cut down the trees. You wouldn't have to apologize for it. You wouldn't have to be ashamed of it. And everybody would celebrate you as a captain of industry because that story was still robust. But not anymore. Not anymore. What we're facing then is, and this is the nature of the revolution. We're facing a transition in our world-defining myths the defining myths of our civilization. I'll call them myths. Separation, myth. Ascent, myth. And I don't mean to denigrate them by calling them a myth, because we're going to replace them with new myths. But it's a profound change.
what's the new story of the people then? And so really what, it, what my work is, is, is to describe what money would look like if it were aligned with the new story of the people and the new story of the self. And I know that it's going to have a lot to do with the gift because the gift, unlike money, expands the self to include all of our relationships. In a gift culture, as I pointed out, it's no longer true that more for you is less for me. It's no longer true that, that you are separate from me because now your good is also my good. So gift economics is aligned with the connected self, the new story of self. The connected self, it, it, it's something that, even if our minds can't quite grasp it, uh, it's something that we can feel, you know? Why else would it hurt to read, to see those pictures of, you know, after the Gulf oil spill and there's those seabirds, you know, staggering on the shore, soaked in oil? Like, why should that hurt? You know, so what? You know? In England, I mean, we don't get shrimp in England from the Gulf of Mexico. We get it from somewhere else. Who cares, you know? Fukushima? You know, that's just some people in Japan. That radiation isn't going to get over here. Who cares? But it hurts us. Because the fact is, the truth is, that what happens to anybody and anything and, and to the planet is happening to us as well. And we can no longer escape that. We, in the, 50 or 100 years ago, it seemed as though we could escape the consequences of our actions. It seemed as though that we were exceptions to ecology, where everything circles back, that we were separate from nature. But today, we can't escape it anymore. The, the circle of karma is getting tighter. So this is something that we can feel, something that we know, just like we know the truth of the gift, that, that we're here to do something, that that serves something greater than ourselves. We're here to give of our gifts. We know that. And for a long time, and this knowledge resides in the heart, and for a long time it was in conflict with our logic and our, and, uh, and our systems. And this conflict is beginning to resolve now. And we're entering into a new logic in which it makes total sense. What we feel makes total sense. Because the story of separation is becoming obsolete. In physics, even, it's becoming obsolete. You know, it's no longer, no longer true that in physics that there's these discrete, separate entities in an objective universe. You know, the, the distinction between subject and object is becoming very questionable. In biology, it's changing, too. It's not these discrete, selfish genes. We're learning that, that, uh, that genetic material is routinely exchanged between organisms, even across species, that were expressions of a genetic plenum, 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 I don't know how to say that word. Um, anyway, that was supposed to make you think I was smart. <laughs> Got to throw a few big words in there um, to make up for my lack of credentials. I shouldn't have admitted that either. <laughs> okay. The new story of the people. What is the ascent over nature, the domination, the conquest of nature? What is, what's replacing that? What's replacing the growth paradigm? I kind of take a hint from biology. You know, some, some environmentalists, in great despair, they say, well, humanity must be nature's great mistake, nature's big mistake, because look at us. All other creatures uh, are, come into equilibrium with their environment, but we're just growing, growing, and growing exponentially forever. But actually, in nature, there are periods of exponential growth and, and, and rapid growth, and they go for a while, and then they level off on, and, and into an equilibrium state. For example, a child grows very fast, has one final growth spurt in adolescence, and then he stops growing. It's only unnatural if you try to prolong growth past that point. 
like I have a 16 year old son. He's about 190 centimeters. And you know what? Like, maybe I should be worried, actually. He, he grew 10 centimeters three years ago, eight centimeters two years ago, only four centimeters last year, and now he's not growing at all. How can I get growth? How can I reignite economic growth? I mean, how can I reignite his growth? That would be insane. I could, maybe if I fed him hormones or something like that. Just like we could get our economy to grow a little bit more. All we have to do is, is frack it and drill in the wildlife reserve. And, and whatever capacity of the atmosphere remains to absorb our waste, let's use that up. Let's squeeze a few more drops of growth out of there to keep this system going a little longer. Because that's all we know how to do. But what we're facing is a transition into adulthood, into a post-growth economy, a steady-state economy. When growth ends and the transition to adulthood happens, there's two things that mark that transition. And I think we're seeing both of them in our civilization. The first thing is that you fall in love. The love relationship changes on entering adulthood. The child loves his mother, loves his father, and his main role, his main role in that relationship is to receive. But when you fall in love, you no longer just want to receive. You want to give also. It's an equal relationship, even a co-creative relationship. You want to create something together. You want to do something together. Maybe even create a family together. And I think that humanity, and I'm talking about the mass culture, civilization, not, I'm not talking about the indigenous, this is a different story, but the bulk of humanity now, industrial civilization, is falling in love with Earth no longer wanting to be in that role of just taking, but wanting to give in turn as well. I think it started really as a mass movement in the 1960s when, when books like Silent Spring came onto the scene. I read that when I was a kid. It had a huge impact on me, huge impact. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Rachel Carson. And, and people read these books and, and they saw what was happening and they no longer desired just to extract, to take from Earth, but they desired to protect the Earth and to give back to Earth. A key moment came when the first photographs of Earth were beamed down from the satellites, and the astronauts came back with these pictures of, of the planet, and it was so beautiful. I don't know if anyone here is old enough to remember the first time that you saw these and how powerful that was, right? Christmas Eve, 1966, yeah, powerful. It was the first time many people saw the earth without borders drawn on it. And it was so beautiful and people, something changed then. The astronauts, they had these, they all had these spiritual experiences when they went up there. They had these, these epiphanies. Um, I quote some of them in, in my books. Um, my favorite is, is, I think it's by Rusty Schweikart. And he said, when I was on the moon, when you're up on the moon looking down at Earth, Earth is this little dot that you can cover with your thumb. And I was up there and I realized, he said, I realized that everything precious to me was all on that little speck. All of music, all of art, all of history, love, death, birth, all of literature, all of culture. Everybody I've ever loved, all on this little blue dot that I could cover up with my thumb. And he said, I, I was never the same after that. The relationship is different now. The relationship is different now. The second thing that happens in the passage to adulthood is that you go through an ordeal. 
primitive cultures understood the necessity of an ordeal and they would create them on purpose. So they would take you out into the bush and tie you to a tree without food or water for three days and you would have a vision. Or they would feed you large amounts of psychedelic plants or they would subject you to severe physical pain, scarification, or they would send you on a vision quest and you better not come back until you've had a vision and we'll know if you haven't. And some people don't come back. Um, whatever it was, these rituals were intense enough to cause your identity to fall apart. Everything that had seemed so real and reliable and permanent was blown away and you didn't know who you were anymore. And that opened you up to take on a larger identity and you would come back from the ordeal as a full member of the tribe. We don't have these ordeals really today and that's one reason why you might find yourself in your 20s or even in your 30s feeling like you're a child playing grown-up somehow. Like here I am dressed like an adult, you know, and with a job and adult clothes and an adult body, but why do I feel like I'm pretending, like I'm playing make-believe here? Um, anyway, the, the, this ordeal would, 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 would make your world fall apart and allow you to take on a new identity, a larger identity that included the tribe. And I think humanity is going through that ordeal right now. That's what all of these crises are doing to us. The world is falling apart. All the things that had seemed so real, so secure, so permanent, are being revealed as, as, as illusion. It's especially obvious in the money system. A generation ago, there was nothing more practical, solid, and permanent than blue chip stocks and triple A bonds and your pension. That was the essence of practicality, and today we no longer trust in the permanence of these things. And many people do have the sense that, that the world is falling apart. They almost get a sense of vertigo, like if you lose your job. Um, so what's happening then is that humanity collectively is also being propelled into our full membership in the tribe of all life on Earth in which we no longer just receive, but we give in turn. So, translating that into economics, that means that our economy can no longer be an exception to ecology, but has to become part of ecology, and that's what we want it to do. Today, it isn't, partly because of the way the money system works. For example, costs to the ecosystem, costs to future generations, costs to society are external to the balance sheet. You can make lots of pollution, but your product will still be very cheap because it doesn't include the cost of that pollution. So one thing I talk about in the book, and this idea is not really that, that radical or that new. Um, Pigot was talking about that in the, in the 20s and 30s. Um, but it's to internalize these costs so that, that the profit motive is aligned with the good of society and the planet. And so that would align money with the new story of the people, which is co-creative partnership in love with Earth. And that's the only kind of money system, I think, that will make sense. Um, the only kind that will end this conflict between what makes my heart sing and uh, where the money is. Like what if the big money were in ecosystem restoration? What if the big money were in permaculture? You know, what if the big money were in social work, healing the, 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 the damage that's been caused by thousands of years of separation? And that's where we want to go anyway. Which means that the division between work and play, between work and life, or work and leisure also begins to crumble. And we no longer have to make ourselves do things we don't want to do in order to make a living. Uh, work has gotten a bad reputation. Economics talks about the disutility 
of work, meaning that you really don't want to work, but you have to, to make a living, and so you do, or to get these things that you want. But if you had your druthers, if you, if you didn't have to work, then you would sit around in front of the TV eating chocolate bonbons all day. Because why, why would you want to work? You know? but, but one of the, so one of the aspects of separation that's breaking down is this, is this dichotomy between work and, and joy. You know? And we're understanding that, yeah, we want to work. And it's not that money makes us do the work we don't want to do. It's that, it's that money stops us from doing the work that we want to do so today. All right, so that's one. I'm just kind of. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna talk too much longer. I'm gonna have questions soon. Um, but I just wanted to give um, one example. Like a, a lot of the book, Sacred Economics, is really about the nitty gritty of how, in fact, do you align money with the new story of the self and the new story of the people, and how do you align it with the principle of the gift? Another principle of the gift. And I mentioned it before, is that the more you give, the richer you are. In the book, I, uh, I quote an um, anthropologist, I think it was Richard Lee, uh, who did his field work in the Kalahari Desert with the Kung, the, otherwise known as the Bushmen. And, and they had a word for wealth that he translated as wealth. That word was kai, kai, K-A-I. And a rich man was called a kaiha. So, Richard Lee asked his informant, Zoma, he said, what is it that makes a man a kaiha? Is it because he has lots of kai in his hut? Lots of, refers to beads and pretty things, valuables that, you know. Is that, is that you know, if he has a lot of kai in his hut, does that make him a kaiha? And Zoma laughed at him and said, no, you don't understand. We don't call a man a kaiha if he has lots of kai in his hut. We call a man a kaiha who makes lots of kai circulate who gives a lot of his kai. Then we call him a kaiha. And Richard Lee said, it seemed as if you were saying that wealth is a matter of how many friends you have rather than how much stuff you have. So another question I play with in the book is, how do you make money like that? And by the way, I'm not, the book isn't only about money. I don't think economics should only be about money. But how do you make money take on this aspect of a gift culture? Where if you have more than you need, then you give it to somebody who needs it. And that creates goodwill, that creates gratitude, that makes you secure because then if you need something, they will take care of you too. It was certainly the case in most hunter-gatherer societies when possessions were a, a literal burden because you had to, they were nomadic and you had to carry them around. Um, also, to a great extent, true in early agricultural societies, uh, before money, especially, you know, where if you had a really rich harvest that year and you have a granary full of grain, is it really going to do you much good to keep it yourself? No, because it's going to rot. It's going to go bad. Rats are going to eat it. You're better off giving it to everybody around you. And then they'll remember that. And when they have a good harvest, they'll give it to you too. And it's, I don't mean to make it sound so calculating. Um, I mean, this dynamic was embedded into kinship systems and, and um, systems of reciprocity. But money's not like that. If I have more money than I need, I'm not going to say, well, I'm not using it now. I'll just let you guys use it because money doesn't go bad. It doesn't go bad because you can invest it in interest. The more you have, the more you can get. Now, we can talk about inflation and risk and things like that, um, so I'm just going to generalize to say that, especially if you have a lot of money, you can beat inflation by investing it uh, free of risk. Free of risk used to mean things like treasury bonds, um, I can't remember what they call them in England, gilts or something. Um, but today, it means anything that you know the government will bail out. So the risk-free interest rate is actually much higher if you have enough money. So money is not like grain. 
Um, let me just give you an example here. Like, there's maybe 250, 300 people here. So, say I have 500 loaves of bread right now in a pile, and I'm a selfish bastard. I want to maximize my self-interest. Is it in my self-interest to keep those all and not let anyone have any? No, because I can't eat that much. It'll go bad. It'll go stale. It's much, it would be better for me to, to give everybody two loaves and say, this is a loan at call. When I ask you for two loaves of fresh bread, just as good as this bread, you have to give me two loaves of fresh bread, okay? I don't have the leverage to say, I'm only going to give you these two loaves if you give me three loaves back. I don't have that leverage. Money's not like bread, but it could be like bread. If it decayed, like bread does, like grain does, like pretty much everything in the natural world does. Money doesn't decay. It's this unnatural thing. It's an exception to the ecological principle of return. And it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, money systems have been devised where the money does decay and were actually applied uh, during the Great Depression in Austria and in the United States and some other places. Um, and I'm not going to go too much into technical detail here um, because, well, it's hard to give a little piece of it without sounding really naive and, oh, Charles must not have thought of this, that, and the other thing. Um, but there's a really long chapter on it in the book and I, and, and I cite some pretty mainstream economists who have played with this idea. Um, William Buter, uh, uh, a few other ones, Federal Reserve Papers even. Um, and the idea basically is to impose a liquidity tax on reserves, on bank reserves in the central bank. Which basically means that money, instead of growing at, say, whatever percent interest, it decays at, say, 5% interest. Cash would have to have some kind of built-in expiry or decay rate also. And so what that means is that if you have, say, if you're a bank, maybe, and you have 10 billion pounds of reserves, and you just hold on to those reserves, by the end of the year, they're only worth 9.5 billion. So it becomes in your interest to lend them, even at zero interest, rather than to hold on to it. To make a very long story short, it allows the money system to work in the absence of growth. It allows the money system to still work when the marginal efficiency of capital is less than zero, meaning that, that basically meaning that the economy isn't growing uh, and there aren't a lot of investment opportunities that will bring even more money back. It allows the system to work without growth. And it brings the economy in line with ecological principles. And some of, some of you who kind of understand what I'm talking about might be, feel very curious and have a lot of questions and I invite you to, to read more about it. My work is online as well as in print. Um, one of the aspects of gift economy that I, I practice is to offer my work as a gift. Um, for example, I don't charge for my events as best I can avoid it. Uh, and, but I allow opportunities for people to give in return if they want to. And that's how the gift works. You know, you, you give it and then you, the, the, the gratitude and sense of value of the recipient motivates the return gift. And you guys have been sitting here for a very long time. Um, so, I, mean, I can take this in a lot of directions, and I'm going to stop in a minute here um, and take questions. A lot of the book is also about the personal dimensions of internalizing this cosmology of the gift and aligning our lives with the felt understanding of inner beingness
Today, to do that, you have to fight not only, I don't, I don't want to say fight, but resist not only your own habits that are inherited from the past, habits of separation, habits of scarcity, but also you have to resist the structures that are around us. The people who say that's crazy to do something just because you love it and you don't know how the return gift is going to come. You put it out there and you don't know what's going to come back. To just trust like that, that's crazy. And there's a little voice inside of you that says that's crazy. And there's a whole money system that says that's crazy. One thing that's happening is that those little voices are getting less compelling. And the systems around us are getting less compelling because they're not working anymore. We're still in a transition stage. One reason that I'm here tonight is to kind of be on the side of that voice that says, it'll be all right. And it's time for me to live my life, not the life that I'm paid to live, not, not somebody else's life. And to say that that's not crazy. It's not crazy because from the perspective of this new story of the people, this new story of interconnectedness, what you do unto the other, you are in fact doing unto yourself. It will come back to you as surely as if you hurt your liver, you will be hurting yourself. Like liver and self are not separate. Right? Our, our existing ideology understands that, but it doesn't understand that world and self are not separate. But now we're coming into a new logic that affirms that. And so it no longer seems so crazy. And I guess that'll be my, my final message is, is that this time of being very lonely in listening to that crazy voice is over. And more and more, we will all receive help from other people who are also living different, in different ways, living in the gift, living from the understanding of connectedness, from the understanding of inner beingness, all of us in a different way. It's not like this big heroic transformation. Every single person I meet, I don't care if they're an investment banker or, or a garbage collector or what, every single person that I meet has in some way begun to pioneer this new territory. This isn't a transition that we make by ourselves through our own efforts. And I've meditated a lot, so therefore I am more in inner beingness than somebody else. That perception comes from separation, doesn't it? Now, there's someone else, not me. So I've done it and they haven't. No, no. It recognizes that, that every person is a mirror of myself. And so this is a, a transition that we all have to make together, and that we are making together. Okay. So thank you for your attention.